We're gonna jump right into regenerative medicine. I'm gonna compact a lot of information into a rather brief uh, talk. And once we get on board with this, we should have all the tools and make sure we're all on the same page to start talking about uh, bioprinting specifically. So regenerative medicine and tissue engineering in a nutshell can be defined as an interdisciplinary field that applies the principles of engineering and life sciences toward the development of biological substitutes that restore, maintain, or improve biological tissue function or a whole organ. It's really important that we consider not just the fact that in, in tissue engineering and biofabrication, we're simply using materials and printing with cells, but it's what happens afterwards that's extremely important. It's that uh, turning 3D printing into a four-dimensional process and incorporating uh, time into our tissue engineering that really gives us the ability to restore, maintain, and improve uh, biological functions or our organs. When we dig deeper into the tissues that we're trying to replicate, tissue organization is uh, by nature very complicated. You have all kinds of structure between the biochemical and physiochemical factors reacting between different cells, between the extracellular matrix around them, as well as the soluble growth factors and proteins that are present within these different tissues. So these complicated interactions dictate your tissue function. They dictate the fate of individual cells as well as the cell population as a whole. And it's gonna be something that we need to carefully replicate as best as we can in some of our biofabrication techniques. Uh, tissue is organized not just on a macro scale level uh, where you have something like a tendon that has certain mechanical properties, but we need to break down and understand these tissues that we're trying to replicate all the way down into a micro scale. So getting as far down even as on a molecular scale where we understand things like collagen content in a tendon. It's important to understand not just, like I said, these macro scales, but these micro scale features because as 3D printing evolves, as the machinery and the materials evolve, we're better able to replicate not just these large organs as a whole, but also things like uh, our collagen and micro scale uh, microscale interactions, which really play the most vital role in tissue maturation, growth, and function. So just another example, we're gonna come back to this uh, throughout the day uh, because this is something that uh, our lab works extremely closely with. This is uh, an osteochondral interface, for, for example, and you can see that in the different zones you have extremely different cell populations, you have different organizations in the extracellular matrix, and you have different mechanical properties throughout this structure. So all tissues, almost all tissues that we're really interested in uh, moving forward in biofabrication is comprised of several levels of structural hierarchy. It's extremely important that we remember this when we're applying that to biofabrication because we do have the ability to start replicating some of these zonal organizations of tissues like this osteochondral uh, interface and it's extremely important that we do get this right, otherwise we're really not doing much better than some of the traditional tissue engineering techniques that are out there. So the very first thing I wanna do, since 3D printing provides kind of that support structure for your cells, is get into the extracellular matrix. And just some of the considerations here uh, are that in the extracellular matrix, you of course have mechanical support for your cells and tissues. It's, it serves as a biochemical barrier as well as a medium for extracellular communications, the positioning of cells, and kind of a guide way for cell migration. These, the extracellular matrix has a large effect on uh, cells, so you can easily uh, impact cell fate simply by the uh, constitution of the extracellular matrix you, imp, uh, you, you add these cells to. So things like soluble factors, physical forces, cell-to-cell -cell contact, cell-to-ECM contact, all can affect the cell fate in a number of ways, from metabolism where we can, uh, we can guide cells and affect cells to produce uh, their own set of growth factors, uh, self-renewal in which we can preserve a stem cell self-renewal uh, population, as well as differenti differentiation, so the extracellular matrix can influence cells to differentiate into uh, more dedicated lineages. Uh, we can also, importantly, uh, guide cells into uh, an apoptotic pathway, as well as we can physically guide cells through migration. Again, th these are all things that we, we will talk about how we can guide those things in 3D printing. Um, and it's also important to understand how we might do that, which 
we can incorporate things like the two main classes of macromolecules that we'll find in the ECM, uh, including uh, proteins and polysaccharides, uh, um, which are linked to proteoglycans in this case. So, like I said, there's a complex pathway in which these extracellular matrix interact with cells. I encourage anyone that's interested in replicating a certain type of tissue to investigate that particular tissue's uh, extracellular matrix to get a better understanding of what it is that you want to incorporate when you're doing 3D printing. Uh, overall, tissue engineering in the laboratory, we can use that knowledge to kind of inform three main areas that we want to focus our time on, which the first, of course, is cells. Cells are the workhorses of our tissues, uh, the living component that really turns us into or, or, or uh, brings us away from just creating prosthetics and turning, turning us into something or turning these projects into something uh, that's actually living. We're, we'll also talk about incorporating biochemical and physical chemical factors, uh, which include everything from growth factors to simply the sheer stresses and sheer forces that a cell might experience once they're implanted in our scaffolds. And we'll talk about the scaffolds themselves, so the biomaterials that we might use uh, to guide cell fate in these uh, different directions that we discussed. Uh, it's also important to consider the cell populations that we might use in 3D printing and developing our biomaterials and which techniques we're using. So just very briefly, uh, autologous uh, cells, cells from you know, the individual that we're re-implanting them, and if we can use autologous cells, it reduces our risk of disease transmission. Uh, reduces, uh, there are no immune reactions that we have to be concerned about although drawbacks, of course, include there, there's likely to be limited availability depending on the type of cells you're interested in using, and we also risk donor site morbidity. Whereas allogenic cells, while they may be more available, uh, they can be uh, less expensive, but disease transmission is a possible risk as well as uh, immune rejection. So we might also be introducing uh, heterogeneous uh, populations because of genetic anomalies between individuals and then finally, xenogenic, which is something we'll probably not work too much with when it comes to actually implantable tissues, but might be helpful if you're doing some kind of drug screening, is the largest pool and least expensive. But of course, the disease transmission and immune reaction, if you're going to actually implant that in a person, is a very real risk and uh, unlikely that we want to use that. Uh, to make sure that we're on the same page then uh, for the different cells that we might use in our biomaterials and 3D printing, uh, we can use everything from mature cells to stem cells. Most likely, we'll be working with adult stem cells or somatic stem cells. Um, potentially, we, we're seeing more research done in induced pluripotent stem cells, which, um, if you haven't heard the term before, are simply somatic uh, cells that have been induced into a pluripotent stem cell-like state. So with that in mind, uh, when we're uh, looking at the uh, biomaterials and the bio inks that we're going to develop for 3D printing, and we're interested in using different cell types, uh, again, it's important to consider primary cells have potential harvest challenges. Uh, cells may be differentiated from patients, and we have age-related challenges if uh, you're looking at uh, autologous cells. Whereas passage cells are probably what we'll mostly be talking about today, um, are serially expanded primary cells, and they may lose function or de-differentiate over passages, so it's not always the most accurate uh, biological representation. And finally, of course, we have our stem cell populations, uh, which are largely undifferentiated, and we have large self-renewal uh, potential there, as well as the potential for these cells to differentiate into functional cell types. This is all relatively easy to affect based off of the kind of matrix and the materials we're using, as well as the processes we're using in 3D printing. So that's going to be something we want to keep in mind later. Our scaffolds for um, both 3D printing and tissue engineering in general have to be selected um, for uh, desirable cellular interactions. So we've largely moved beyond using bioinert materials. And uh, nowadays, most of our research focuses on materials that have some kind of function, whether they're guiding cell growth uh, or differentiation in function. And much of the goal here isn't to create a 3D printed uh, uh, implant, but to create a scaffold that's going to degrade and become uh, natural tissue over time. The, when we're talking about 
our scaffolds and um, degradation po potential, it's really important that we consider a few, uh, few potential points. So the first is the bulk mechanical properties of the material, of course, we want to replicate the tissue. In this case, if we're looking at something like a blood vessel, we want to make sure that the materials that we use are, of course, have high tensile strength, high elasticity compared to a material we might use uh, for an osteochondral defect. But besides the bulk mechanical properties, we also need to make sure that, the, uh, that we get the geometry right, not just on the macro scale, but on a micro scale, uh, which you're going to hear me say probably several times today, that the overall architectural choices we make with our scaffold can be replicated so that we, that we can uh, replicate um, what the cell sees at a cellular level. Um, again, that's something that we'll talk about more later. But part of getting that micro scale geometry right is including porosity in our scaffolds. So it's extremely important that we consider how we can add uh, porosity to a uh, tissue engineering scaffold and a bioprinted scaffold for a number of reasons. And the first is if we're looking at pore diameter, increasing the surface area gives us more area for adherent cells uh, or cells to adhere to and gives us more of, of a denser cell population, which is extremely important in uh, many of the tissues that we will be looking at. Uh, porosity, of course, kind of goes without saying that it allows for cellular infiltration and not just cellular infiltration to our scaffold, but also the diffusion of nutrients, uh, growth factors, things like that that are vital towards keeping our bioprinted scaffold alive. We can also use pores if we can um, deliberately manufacturing, manufacture porosity into our scaffold to direct cell migration and growth. This is uh, one great advantage of 3D printing is that we can align porosity to fit uh, our, our methods, whether we are implanting something and relying on um, cells in the natural environment to migrate into that scaffold, or we want to guide the migration of cells in an implanted scaffold outward or just within the tissue. We have that ability to orient our porosity. And the overall percentage of porosity in our scaffolds does affect mechanical properties and, like I said, the volume for the cell population. So we'll consider both of these factors uh, later today. But again, it's really important to keep that in mind when you're designing things like picking the materials for your 3D printed scaffold or you are designing the CAD model itself. These are all factors that will be important. Mm. There's a variety of uh, materials that are available for scaffolds. Um, I'm not going to go into all these different materials and material properties. Uh, rather, I'd like to focus today on uh, what you're looking for when you're choosing these different materials for your scaffolds. Uh, we, of course, have the customizability of synthetic scaffolds. So if you're using things like polycaprolactin, so polylactic acid, we have the, we have the ability to help uh, guide the molecular weight of these materials, which can affect things like mechanical properties or, uh, or uh, degradation. Whereas with natural polymers, we tend to have uh, increased cell viability, especially when using these in a 3D printed substance. And we find that some of these naturally derived polymers support better cell attachment um, compared to maybe uh, the cheaper, but more potentially more widely available plant-based uh, polymers such as alginate. So after uh, we're choosing these different materials, it is important not just to consider what material we're using uh, to, to create our scaffold, but also what happens once that scaffold's implanted. Like we talked about, biodegradation is something very important that we're going to be, we're going to be discussing. And we need to ensure that we have an understanding of the degradation time, the degradation rate of our materials, as well as the function of these materials as they degrade. We also need to ensure that the moieties released as these polymers degrade and, uh, and go into the bloodstream uh, is well understood. So it's extremely important that when you're customizing any of these polymers, whether they're naturally derived or synthetically derived, that those degradation components also do nothing to uh, or have no deleterious effects on our uh, cells or tissues in the, around the implantation area. Different materials, of course, affect cell binding, uh, and not just cell binding, but they can even influence cell fate and uh, cell differentiation. And of course, the mechanical strength of our materials changes both on a 
on a bulk strength level, as well as a micro scale level uh, on things like stiffness, which does impact cell, uh, cell fate, which we'll discuss in a little bit. So going into a further discussion on cell fate in designing these scaffolds, I want to talk about the biochemical and physical chemical factors that affect cells. It's extremely important that we understand all these different factors that affect cells for different cell populations that we're looking for because we can replicate these and include these factors in our 3D printed constructs. So a variety of factors affect cells from cell to cell interaction, cell to electro, extracellular matrix interactions, or just soluble growth factors. And there are a number of different complicated pathways that uh, these, uh, these different factors do affect cells. Um, I don't want to get into a, a molecular discussion today, but it's important just to kind of consider what of uh, these factors, um, what tissues they're relevant to, as well as what, uh, what influence they have on cellular fate. Um, it's, it's possible to combine a few different growth factors within our 3D printed constructs, and that's something that I want to make sure we have a good understanding of later. But not just the chemical factors, but also the physical factors that affect cell growth. So things like surface topography, shear force, and the, the substrate stiffness of the scaffold itself will affect the reactions of your cells within your 3D printed construct. Uh, in this case, um, uh, things like even just adjusting the way cells attach or constraining cells can drastically affect the way cells uh, react in, in uh, vitro and in vivo. So for instance, if you have uh, a mesenchymal stem cell and it's restricted to a round shape, such as uh, if you implant it in alginate, uh, you can, uh, that, that cell can end up um, going down an apoptotic pathway or being stuck perpetually in a mesenchymal stem cell self-renewal cycle. Whereas if you have a spread mesenchymal stem cell, as you see in that first one, you're more likely to differentiate that into an osteoblast, even keeping uh, the media the same, just changing cell geometry has a drastic effect. Taking those same cells and putting them on different substrate stiffnesses using different materials, you can, uh, that alone can affect the differentiation of cells. And of course, it goes without saying, extracellular matrix influence based off of what the cell quote unquote sees on the surface of, uh, on the cell membrane drastically affects different lineages. And like I said before, the geometric structures do also affect cells. This is something, these are all different aspects that we can incorporate in 3D printing that are important to integrate into 3D printing. So with that, I wanna wrap up uh, the regenerative medicine discussion and keep in mind just the effect that different cells, different materials, and different factors have on tissue engineering, and hopefully we can apply those strategies to biofabrication. The overall goal of tissue engineering is to mimic the natural environment or take advantage of attributes to of the natural environment to influence cell and tissue behavior. It's not always possible to exactly replicate all the complex interactions you get inside the extracellular matrix, but if we can find those important elements, such as the, you know, that list of growth factors I showed you, and apply those into a bioink, for instance, we can better encourage our uh, tissue scaffold to act in a function that's uh, more helpful to our purpose. So all these factors that we you know, briefly went over do affect our choice in the scaffold design, the materials we use, the cell sources we use, and these are all gonna come up over and over again when we get into a more complex discussion of biofabrication.